So as mentioned in the introduction, I will um, try to, of course, uh, talk about the new Budapest bridge um, that we are involved in. Um, but not only about the bridge, uh, but I will also try to give a little bit of an overview about the, the practice in general. Um, a few of our uh, most recent um, projects, including some urban design projects, but also um, some of our latest key developments um, and a few of our more um, historic uh, projects that uh, that are very important and part of of the DNA of UN Studio. So what's UN Studio about? Um, our main objective is, of course, to create um, human centric architecture. Everything is focused around the users and um, their experiences of our proposals. But of course, we have to be conscious um, about what impact our designs have on the environment. And um, also how we can use our expert knowledge as architects and designers to mitigate the impact of what we are actually implementing into the environment. So this applies not only um, to um, our large developments, but to all scales and all interventions uh, from small scale to uh, cities within cities. And of course, for all types of um, architecture from cultural to infrastructure projects of the future. And we, of course, always strive to apply the latest technological standards in our designs to achieve buildings with uh, optimal performance values. And uh, we are really keen on um, really digging deep into uh, the latest technological um, features to prepare our projects for the future ahead. And uh, what, what we are trying to do in essence is uh, to aim at creating meaningful places, places uh, that people remember, places that uh, people want to come back to, and uh, places that give new identities to the places that, um, that they are at. And um, this is one of my favorite images to share. Um, Yes, in, in the end, we always we always hope that our project have a lasting impact. So having said that, um, I would like to give you a little bit of an overview of what uh, we are doing um, at UN Studio. So the disciplines that uh, we are covering within our studio range from um, urban planning, architecture, interior design, of course. But not only that, uh, we also design products. And uh, by doing that, um, we actually do a lot of experimentation in terms of form finding and um, usability that then later inform our architecture. Um, so it's it's like a like a loop of of experimenting and and feeding back this knowledge into any scale of projects. And most uh, recently, we are also developing um, uh, user uh, platforms uh, in our UX design team. And um, we also have a, a forecasting um, unit that is looking into the, the future and um, what is uh, to come in terms of design, architecture and technology. So UN Studio um, is located in Amsterdam, the headquarters in Amsterdam. It was founded in 1988 by Ben van Berkel and Caroline Boss. And currently um, we have around 200 staff in Amsterdam. And in addition to that, we have a few satellite offices. As you can see on this slide, um, the biggest one is located in Shanghai with uh, approximately 50 staff um, followed by Hong Kong and our most recent uh, satellites include Frankfurt 
and uh, the very new ones, uh, Dubai and also Melbourne in Australia. So currently our uh, project portfolio includes around 125 completed projects around the globe. And we are working on projects in 42 countries. At the moment uh, of which 17 are under construction. At UN Studio, we also have specialized design units uh, giving valuable input during the design processes of all projects. And we do that because we believe that that ensures the best possible quality um, tailor made for for every project. So we are really using these expert units within our studio to um, give us food for thought and to improve our design uh, strategies and uh, the design ideas. Um, keeping in mind always, um, you know, the location and the users who will then um, who will then uh, live with these interventions and and with the architecture that we are proposing and um, implementing into the cities. So this is a very important part at UN Studio to to really um, really collaborate with each other um, with people from different uh, fields of design, which which really um, helps us to to develop uh, uh, much more unique um, visions and, and proposals. Yes, and I already mentioned um, that we are trying to design with the future in mind, um, which means not only um, anticipating what the future will bring in terms of um, our society, but also technology, latest softwares. Um, so we are always trying to challenge ourselves and, and trying to really um, keep ourselves up to date with um, what's out there in the world of um, design, architecture and urban planning. So, um, yeah, um, I would like to go through a few um, key projects that I will later explain um, a little bit further, at least some of them. Um, so, one of the very early key projects at the UN Studio is an infrastructure project, uh, which is the Erasmus Bridge in Rotterdam. Um, so this goes back to 1992. Um, another key project that um, that is very important to the studio is the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart. Um, I will explain that one um, a little bit more in detail later on. Um, the central station in Arnhem in the Netherlands is uh, one of our longest uh, projects which I would also like to, to explain a little bit uh, more in detail a little bit later on. Um, as well as the government tax office in Groningen in the Netherlands, which was one of the first projects where we were really um, diving into new work environments. Um, and uh, a few more recent uh, key projects include the Doha Metro network, um, so this uh, this was a, a project uh, that included 97 uh, metro stations, of which 37 have already been completed, and that project have has been launched with the thought of preparing Qatar for the soccer world championships. A very recent one. Um, that is currently under detailed design um, is the South Bank by Beulah Towers in Melbourne. And of course, the Wassel Tower in Dubai, which is um, already topped out. And I will also share a few slides with more details about that project later. And um, our for Frankfurt development in the city center of Frankfurt, adding um, four very unique towers right in the in the heart of the of the city, uh, complementing the skyline of Frankfurt. Um, 
yeah and and those are projects that that are um either already constructed or are going um on site very soon um but currently we are also um, involved in in the hyperloop program together with heart and um this is this is a more speculative project um, that we really like to be involved in because it's about the future of transportation of public transportation and um, for that specific study we were envisioning um, how a hyperloop station might look like and how we could connect um, cities within the European Union with that type of um, means of transport. So that's uh, one of those um, future forward thinking, um, more re research driven projects that we, we also are always very interested in at UN Studio. Yes, so this was um, a short introduction about some of our key projects and um, uh, what we are what we are trying to do at UN Studio and what, what our main objectives are within the practice. Um, but now I would like to, to talk a little bit about our infrastructure projects. Um, and uh, we call that group of projects um, at UN Studio Mobility Plus. And um, the most recent addition to that uh, series of infrastructure projects at UN Studio was um, of course the new Danube Bridge in Budapest. And um, yeah, I would like to show a few slides about the bridge and um, where we are currently in terms of the design process. Um, but uh, to start with, I would like to um, to talk a little bit about the, the competition design and what uh, our idea was based around uh, back in 2017. And this slide um, shows you a little bit of the inspirational images that we were triggered by and um, that actually uh, yeah, informed the, the look and feel of, of our proposal of the new Danube Bridge. And um, the main objective of our proposal was that um, we we actually um, wanted to to propose something that um, that brings both sides, uh, the Buddha side and the Chapel Island side, in balance with each other. So um, therefore, we consciously decided um, not to highlight any uh, of these uh, sides of the river, but instead uh, we decided to go for a two pylon. Um, proposal. And uh, we were very much inspired by that inviting gesture of, of hands, um, basically welcoming um, everyone coming into uh, the city on the Buddha side or um, on going towards the chapel side in, in the same way. So we, we anticipate that this bridge uh, will uh, trigger, of course, um, a lot of development um, along the south of Budapest. And, and therefore, we also consciously decided that the chapel site um, needed a, a similar inviting gesture, kind of a gateway that, um, that um, basically um, underlines um, accessing either side of the river. Um, so for us, these gestures um, had a very calm and balanced appearance, which um, inspired the look of the pylons. Um, yes, and um, as already mentioned, back in 2017, we participated in a competition for the design of the uh, new bridge over the Danube. And what was very interesting about the competition was that um, the jury um, consisted of um, a mix of, of public uh, figures and and just people like uh, you and I um, really uh, involving the public um, into the decision taking process, which was very unique. Um, but um, 
yeah, for us, it was uh, it was a very successful outcome. The jury decided uh, unanimously that um, our proposal should uh, should go ahead. And um, what I believe made a difference um, to the other entries were maybe two um, two features that we proposed. Um, of course, one of them was uh, the two pylon. Um, design, uh, but also we proposed an at grade connection to the uh, Budafoki street. Um, the brief suggested uh, an above grade connection, basically uh, meaning that we would cross uh, the Budafoki street um, with, a, with an extended bridge structure. But in our opinion, that would um, have been a very, very um, harsh intervention into this kind of um, Buddha site embankment uh, of the Danube. <clears throat> and we actually, we actually thought that um, <clears throat> that proposing an, an at grade junction is a much better solution and much more environment friendly uh, with with more qualities for the human than um, an above grade junction. So in this um, competition drawing, you can see that um, we are not crossing the Buddha Foki Street uh, with a bridge structure, but we are actually connecting at great, which um, actually um, leaves a lot of that area um, untouched uh, by uh, heavy uh, infrastructural um, construction. And overall, we believe that um, that decision was a, a key driver also for the jury to, to um, select our proposal, um, because in essence, it's uh, also reducing the bridge's impact on the environment. <clears throat> Um, so the pylons um, form these uh, type of uh, gateways towards uh, both sides of the river. And within our lighting approach, we wanted uh, also to highlight this experience of entering uh, the city and decided to emphasize the internal sides of, of each pylon. So you can see on this image that um, we are really trying to um, to illuminate the internal side, which then uh, creates that kind of um, emphasized moment of um, of entering through the through the gate to to either side of the river, and um, what what this also um, uh, brings in terms of um, in terms of a positive impact on the environment is that it actually uh, reduces uh, the light pollution. Because these structures are, of course, uh, large structures. We are talking about approximately uh, 90 meter high pylons. Um, so you can imagine that um, a lot of lighting is needed to really um, um, to really illuminate it. So uh, we also kept in mind that um, light pollution is important to be mitigated, which this proposal does as well. Uh, yes, and of course, I wanted to share also a slide from the from the very very early times of sketching um, a little bit um, and trying to find the best solution for this uh, for this bridge back in the in the competition um, process. Um, and um, it was a very informed process. Uh, we we really took uh, time to to decide what what uh, bridge typology um, is appropriate for this location and what can really serve the city um, and enable the, the city to grow uh, in the south um, of Budapest. Um, so you can see here is that we went through multiple design sketches which were tested uh, a lot in terms of um, structural efficiency and uh, feasibility. Um, which which helped us to then decide for option four, <clears throat> as you can see here, which was uh, the balance option. And uh, again, coming back to the 
um, to the decision of connecting the bridge at grade with Budafoki uh, Street. Uh, you can see on this image that uh, by that we are also creating really smooth transitions from uh, the crossing down to the riverbank. Um, there's always an opportunity to um, to be connected to the to the river um, edge. You always have uh, um, uh, view lines towards the river, so there's no obstructing structure that would have been there if you imagine um, this bridge to be um, elevated above Budofoki Street. Yeah, um, so this is another competition image, um, and I'm showing this image um, just to understand the, the size um, of, um, of infrastructure that we are talking about. So this bridge will, um, will be uh, approximately 41 meters wide along its main span and it uh, will basically allow for four car lanes and uh, two tram lanes <clears throat> and on each side we we will um, have bike lanes and uh, a very uh, generous uh, pedestrian lane so um the project is uh, currently in its building permit stage we basically finalized the building permit and it will, will be um, reviewed soon by the city and by the authorities. So, um, of course, we are hoping that we will get the approval. Uh, I think the team, um, the team uh, worked really, really hard to get to this point. It's, a, it's an enormous milestone for this project um, because such an infrastructural intervention involves many, many stakeholders who together with the client and the design team ensure the feasibility of such a bridge, um, which has a lifespan of at least 100 years. Um, so therefore, it re requires much more detail and effort from everyone involved to get to a building permit level, which um, compared to a architectural building, uh, just takes much longer because everything uh, needs to be yeah, almost bulletproof. Everything um, needs to be really feasible and thought through to the bolt. And um, even at the permit um, design level, we already had to take a lot of uh, details into consideration to, to allow the authorities to really understand how this structure will uh, perform, how it will work. And um, yeah, during the past two and a half years, um, we worked uh, very hard to ensure that this vision can become reality in the near future. So um, we had to implement many, many changes from the competition um, design to make sure that all aspects of the design are according to all regulations and meet the expectations of all the third parties involved. So, in our opinion, the design improved over time and it improved a lot and we were able to, to add important features to the design, such as direct access to the riverbank from the bridge deck via, via stairs, which haven't been part of the design in the competition stage. And, um, you know, we enhanced design solutions for the underpass areas below the bridge um to allow uh, you know really um, human friendly uh, passages underneath um, and that had a lot to do with uh, with the right lighting uh, design and the right finishes um, and and of course there were a lot of um, a lot of uh, changes that included reducing the the width of the deck optimizing it to make the structure more efficient um, and also to yeah to to be within the the regulations and the code that uh, has been prescribed to this uh, to this design. And um, of course, um, if we are looking today at the at the design as it uh, stands, 
um, the, the, the main driver overall during the past two and a half years was to maintain the vision for the design of the bridge as it has been selected by the jury um, back in 2017. Um, this was very important to everyone and I think um, the team together with the client um, and the authorities was able to, to achieve that. I think when we look, we look at the design today, um, it is different in details, of course, but um, overall the, the essence of the design has been maintained. So we prepared a, a short film of the bridge um, last year. I would like to share this with, uh, with you. I don't think the sound will work, but maybe I can say some words. Yeah, so this video um, has been prepared after the so-called approval stage. So that um, has been February 2020. And yeah, it basically tries to to illustrate how the bridge is being erected, how it's being put in place, um, how, the, how all the components come together, the backstay cables, the pylon goes on top of the pier, and then both sides are connected by the, by the deck. Um, so the, the main span between the pylons of the bridge is around 220 meters. So it's a significant span and a significant stretch. Yeah, and you can see also the width of the trunk lanes that the bridge will have to carry. Yeah, and you, you can see there's a lot of nat natural environment. And therefore, we really believe in the head way. Yeah, also the, all the lighting um, design, all the lighting design. Again, there had to be in the district over the last hundred years or so. So, um, every little detail on this bridge takes a lot of effort to get to the, to the stage of implementation. Yes, um, so uh, this is the last slide about the bridge. Um, yeah, I can just say that we are really glad to have the opportunity to be involved in such an iconic project in Budapest. And we, we also really believe that it will trigger growth and development in, in, in Budapest South. And more importantly, it will also improve the traffic conditions of the city. Um, because the purpose of this Southern Ring Road is, is of course, mainly that, mainly to, to really uh, reduce the traffic impact within the, the center, the historic center of, of Budapest. Yes, um, so now I will go through through um, a few other projects, uh, as I mentioned in the in the beginning. The first one is the Arnhem Central, Central Station Master Plan. Um, and what's important about this project is that we were actually able to convince and uh, prove to the city of Arnhem that it needs something more than simply a new train station. Um, and we developed a proposal that would allow easy transitions between all the different means of transport. Because what we are what we are talking about here in in Arnhem is actually that um, there are several means of public transport that all come together in this one um, one spot. Uh, so there's uh, regional buses, there's local buses, there are cars, there's many, many bicycles, as you know, in the Netherlands, um, every everybody uh, rides uh, a bike. 
there is uh, the taxis and uh, the pedestrians, and then of course uh, the trains. So uh, our proposal included the so-called transfer hall, uh, which was a key component of the design, enabling a, a natural way, wayfinding for the users between all means of transport without intersecting them. So in Arnhem, there are 100,000 travelers um, going through the station a day. And this was a key argument in order for the station uh, to function and to have this, uh, this type of transfer hall. Um, so this is an image of this uh, transfer hall where all these um, flows of people towards the different means of public transport are being separated and guided um, guided to the right location. So we created this uh, self-supporting structure which generated large column-free spaces that uh, were needed to handle the amount of passengers. And at the same time, we, we connected the transfer hall to all adjacent transfer locations on different levels. And uh, with that, we minimized the chances of people using the same routes while going to these different locations. Um, what was also very important in this project was daylight uh, as a natural means of wayfinding. Um, and for example, by really enlarging the, the openings from the platforms towards this kind of connection tunnel, uh, we were even able within something that is called tunnel to, to create that kind of really lit, um, day lit quality um, that really um, enhanced the entire um, project a lot. Yes. Um, Another project that I would like to mention is uh, is the Qatar um, metro lines that we were uh, designing. Um, so in in 2012, UN Studio has been selected for the design of the of the new metro network in Qatar, and this was a very challenging project, which included the design of around 100 stations. Um, so we designed the key stations, um, but in addition. To that, we did developed a branding manual for the entire network. And um, that allowed different contractors um, to assure the design quality for each station. So this was the largest project by far that UN Studio was involved with, and it challenged the team um, to find new ways of communicating our design approach and to assure the quality of, of each station. And this uh, became this branding manual, and uh, it was, it was, uh, yeah, you could call it a design bible for the metro network, setting up principles for every detail and creating a toolkit um, that allowed for, you know, appropriate solution at any location for all of these stations without, you know, the 100% uh, involvement of the architect. So it was really modular, and you could put parts together and create. Um, these uh, these metro stations. Um, and currently 37 of those stations are built. And um, yeah, we are hoping that that it will continue to grow the network. Um, yeah, and we are we are quite quite proud and happy about about this project. Yes, um, so in in this second part of, of the presentation, I would like to focus a little bit on uh, on a few urban design proposals that we um, worked on in the, yeah, in the in the most recent past. Uh, and I, I selected two projects, and they are both very unique and very different in size and location. Um, and the first one that uh, that I selected. Um, is in Budapest, and it uh, is our proposal for the Southgate Master Plan. Um, and um, as we know, Budapest is ranked as one of the most livable Central European cities, and is one of the most visited ones in the world for its cityscape, heritage, historical monuments, but also for the culture and uh, the hospitality. So um, our campus proposal for uh, lifelong learning uh, would provide fertile ground for 
existing and future communities to grow and thrive in the center of Europe. And um, our main concept for this proposal um, revolves around the establishment of the Blue City, which is uh, uh, an idea of uh, a synthesis of water and technology. Um, so most of you know that uh, where the site is located is close to the to the bridge, uh, at the just south of the of the Budapest city center. And it's uh, yeah, it's 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 directly at the Danube, Danube River, and um, there is a side uh, side arm of the of the Danube that uh, adds even more water to this location. Uh, so by its very nature, the river is regularly treading beyond it, its base, and therefore um, vast parts of this area are flooded. So we thought that instead of separating off the river by embankments, uh, we would propose uh, an involved strategy for wetlands and um, we would naturally form and benefit from the water surrounding the area. So the changing water levels are beneficial for a wide uh, variety of ecological zones and a network of streams, fish ramps, wetlands and water filtering foliage would allow nature to flourish and allow for the return of the local wildlife even. Uh, so the the blue and green infrastructure was developed on a sponge city model, which uh, ensured the mitigation of rain and, and flooding events. So this is a, an image of, of this kind of wetlands um, park that we envisioned. So um, we thought of that kind of um, skywalk route above these kind of flooded wetland um, areas. Um, and in this way, the waterfront becomes transformed into uh, a rich ecological habitat and a prime destination throughout the year. That was that was our main objective to create um, something something different for this area. And the second part of the Blue City concept uh, focused on the implementation of a technological layer. So on the one hand we had the water, on the other hand we have the technological layer. Um, and um, some of the local heritage buildings were revitalized in order to serve for future needs. So for example, the old um, railway, railway tracks were transformed into a smart spine with self-driving cars and electrical charging stations, whilst, for example, the wholesale uh, market hall which uh, is also located on uh, site, uh, would uh, be converted into a startup hub with various um, innovation plazas, such as this one on this image. So our uh, proposal tackled the large scale of the site by developing um, seven distinctive um, connected neighborhoods. Uh, that each celebrated their own unique identity and expression. So um, in these um, diagrams, you can see these kind of seven neighborhoods. And uh, we thought about an active sports park um, or the uh, ecological promenade that I showed in the previous image um, and the heritage and innovation neighborhood, the events district uh, and the Danubus gateway. So um, each zone had a specific anchor point that uh, activated its natural surrounding with a diverse and uh, cohesive set of program. And a meandering path um, was binding each zone together, allowing for a clear future-proof phasing and accessibility. So um, that was our proposal for, for that development. So overall, we tried to create a proposal that um, intertwined the natural setting uh, of the development area with uh, carefully designed neighborhoods uh, for the users and, uh, of course, the water. Um, the second uh, urban design project I would like to share is the Penang Island development. 
So um, we participated in this um, competition last year. And um, I'm sharing uh, this project for two reasons. One is um, that it's, it's a very unique opportunity to participate in designing islands. Um, but the other one is that this was the first project that um, we had to deal with from home because we started the project right um, when the pandemic started. So not only we were challenged by the sheer size of this development, but we also had to learn how to work together and collaborate um, together without actually being in one space. So um, yeah, this, this whole process was, was a good, a very steep learning curve for us with regards to um, collaboration online. So um, Penang Island is um, located at the western coast of uh, Malaysia and it has its own um, airport um, and industrial park uh, located right at the airport, uh, which basically uh, focuses on tech manufacture. So the idea um, of the government was uh, to expand the tech part, but also to upgrade it into, into a more um, high-end type of um, uh, clientele. So uh, the vision was that Island A would, uh, would be that type of um, tech island. Uh, island B would be the, the office and commercial islands, so to say, and then on Island C, uh, we would find leisure and resorts. Um, so that was the brief um, in a very, very uh, short summary. Um, and there were, there were already master plans that have been developed as a, yeah, as a first type of uh, study for, for this development. Um, but our task for this uh, design competition was to come up with something, um, some, something different, something new, something that would really allow for this um, development to, yeah, to be uh, future-proof, so to say, and to, yeah, to involve, yeah, as much as possible um, in terms of uh, technology and 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 new means of um, of transportation as possible. So we understood very quickly that this master plan uh, needed us to the designers to to better understand the local life and the people of Penang. Um, so we tried to filter the key features of Penang, which would help us to design an appropriate proposal for the new islands. And um, yeah, Penang is, is very famous for, uh, for their fishermen. Fishermen are a very important group of people in this area and uh, yeah they they have a very very interesting um iconic uh, street cuisine um, but also they have in georgetown um, which is a unesco world heritage yeah there's there's a lot of cultural institutions um and of course it has a lot of um, yeah, heritage traders and then that type of touristic um touristic sh shopping uh, opportunities so uh, we got very involved in many workshops uh, in order to understand this location and, and as i said it was all online uh, this was uh, i think right before the pandemic started so we were still able to take some uh, pictures of that um, yeah but we really tried to understand uh, the location and its challenges and advantages and the people and other key aspects and that resulted in these kind of user group sheets that helped us during our decision making process so we really analyzed who are the fishermen for example and what do they need what do they um what do they do how does their um day-to-day -day life look like and how can we improve it how can we give something back to them how can we um how can we involve them um, within the design processes So our approach um, was actually that uh, Penang needs space to grow, but we are not looking just at the physical space on the three islands, but we proposed a holistic approach instead. 
So we saw Penang as an archipelago of uh, symbiotic relationships between the new and the old. And we needed to think beyond architectural space, but uh, more towards ecological and civic space. So um, the approach was to create a, yeah, a holistic design that includes all the existing um, factors and involves them uh, into the new proposal. So in order to, to do that, uh, we took three main elements and blended them together into a novel hybrid of, so to speak, urban living. Um, so this hybrid model included making space for water, which is a key ingredient in this location. Um, we created uh, three distinct types of water bodies within the proposal. Uh, the seashore, of course, which was also needed as a means of flood protection, but we also introduced the canal waterfront uh, in the middle and the lake shore towards the southern edge of the existing island. Um, as the next step, we created a green connection towards the islands, resulting in the so-called lifeline, meandering through all of the three islands, which also allowed uh, for the existing uh, flora and fauna to really occupy um, the new development. Um, and by creating green boulevards, we included shaded pedestrian zones to trigger pedestrian movement in this, in this hot and humid environment. And as I already said, the fishermen were a key group <clears throat> to be addressed here. Uh, currently, they live and work at the southern coast of Penang. And we suggested to relocate the harbors and to offer them much more potential to grow their businesses um, in vicinity of the new island hubs. And of course, the infrastructure uh, was key in this in this huge development. Um, so we suggested to create a hybrid network <clears throat> where the northern part of the islands would be accessible by car via seven bridges. Uh, while the southern part would be car free and would uh, support new environment friendly means of transport. Um, and each of these three islands had their own distinct hub in the center. Sorry. <clears throat> Around um, this lifeline with uh, with this kind of meandering water body in the center. And uh, these hubs were actually um, giving each island a different identity in order to create more diversity throughout this development. So um, what we also did is uh, we integrated possibilities of new renewable energy within the design, ma making the development future proof, which means we proposed um, floating PV islands in front of the three islands. But uh, we also thought of 100% zero, zero emission um, um, architecture uh, with uh, green and PV roofs and um, yeah the idea was to to use as much as possible um, renewable energy sources so overall this was the the master plan result uh, we created in our opinion a holistic approach for the future of, of Penang um, and I would like to just explain to you why we we um, we treated the water in a way that we did because uh, that was a, a key key element of this design. Uh, because the the idea was that um, these these islands would be built with a, yeah full reclamation with a sea defense all around each island. So basically. The light blue and the dark blue would be all sea defense, but we th we thought that this has a big disadvantage, and uh, we actually proposed um, to close off the southern shore, and by doing that, um, we we reduced the the environmental impact because um, what that uh, what that uh, idea generated was actually. Uh, 30% less reclamation material because, because we could lower the, the, the elevation of the islands because we only had to protect it at the southern edge. Um, 
and uh, yeah, overall, it, it would have saved um, around 4 billion euros. So that was a, a key, key driver for this idea. And uh, we also thought that giving back to the community um, is important. So the lake uh, can actually function as a fresh water reservoir that catches every drop and uh, can supply water to the, to the new islands. And this new development would need a water reservoir somewhere else on the island in order to have water supply. So that's why we thought, OK, it's much, uh, much smarter to actually create a lake that would be this water reservoir already. And of course, the proposal um, included a large green area that would approximately cover one third of it and would allow for the local flora and fauna to flourish. So we created these kind of links um, at both sides of these islands um, that would basically connect back to the existing flora and fauna. And these green boulevards um, that we suggested uh, would basically promote an active lifestyle throughout the islands, uh, which would allow for more walkable and shaded pedestrian zones also. So we were thinking about um, a lot of canopies. How can we provide comfortable um, temperatures in this region? What means of architecture or nature can we use to, to really provide, um, provide areas where people like to walk? Uh, so we really aimed for a healthy city, which was one, um, yeah, which was an important item that would improve uh, the physical, social, and mental health of the residents. Um, yeah, and and as I already said, the fishermen um, were a, a key group of people that uh, were involved in the decision-making process as well. Um, so uh, it was important for us to to create new uh, locations for these fishermen wharfs, uh, which would be much better connected to the lively new islands and would allow their businesses to grow in the future. Yeah, and um, in order to, to create a walkable city, um, we actually started to question also the, the brief in terms of um, program and uses and distribution of, um, of uses because it was um, it appeared to us very monofunctional and uh, we believed that in order to create a healthy walkable city we have to actually um, uh, make sure that um, everything that uh, a person needs in in their day-to-day -day life is um, is uh, is walkable is in walkable distance so you don't need to get a car or um, take your moped to drive to the grocery uh, store or to the doctor, but you have to make sure that there is all these kind of functions um, nearby. So uh, we proposed in the end a mixed use program for the islands. Um, <clears throat> so um, we took all these kind of key ingredients that uh, that uh, the client and the brief uh, prescribed to us, and we actually um, distributed uh, in a much more uh, mixed way, because we believed that that was the only way to create um, a livable, healthy city where you wouldn't be depending on um, on uh, cars and and mopeds to move around. And this is a, a diagram about that um, idea of splitting the the means of transport. So basically, the red suggests that you can enter the island uh, by car, but then there is a gradient and a borderline, so to speak, where um, we would we would introduce car-free zones and only um, yeah electric vehicles could enter or um, or other means of, of future public transport would be um, would be allowed there. So it was this kind of idea of, of creating a, a transition between what we are used to today and what we should be doing in the future. And finally, um, because this development is so huge, uh, we came up with a phasing strategy so um, we basically also 
suggested that by um, creating that type of mixed use uh, distribution of program, each part of these islands can be autonomous while the other parts are being constructed, which was also a, an important aspect. Yes, and um, so overall, uh, what we are talking about here is uh, 4,500 acres of surface and around 18 million of uh, cross floor area, um, which would then allow for a, a population of around 370,000 people. So that was, um, yeah, I think a very unique opportunity to be able to participate in this this type of um, project. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yes, so um, in this uh, last section of the presentation, I would uh, like to briefly uh, highlight a few of our ongoing projects. Uh, ranging from campus and work, which is the first um, typology uh, to residential, and um, I will I will finish with uh, with a cultural project. So the first project I would like to um, share with you is the Booking.com headquarter in Amsterdam. Um, so this project evolves around the uh, new work environments again. The client which is booking.com currently has uh, several departments divided over many locations in Amsterdam. And their aim was to bring the entire organization together within one campus. So um, due to the nature of the of those departments being very diverse in the sense of how they work and what what they do. Our design proposal required a very agile work environment proposal. Um, so we had to give space to any type of work environment needed by the employees, and that had to be um, transformable at any time. <clears throat> so this is a, a current image of the construction. So um, we are expecting the building to be completed in um, 2022. Um, yeah, and uh, since we are located in Amsterdam, this is a, 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 an important one for us because um, yeah, this is one of the few projects that we can just walk to, to see it and visit it, which um, most of the times is not possible. Um, another project that, that is currently ongoing is the Green Spine. Um, so it's a design for two towers in Melbourne, um, and our design has been selected as the winning proposal in, in an international competition. Um, and just to summarize briefly the, the concept or the idea, um, which was basically pulling the, the public realm um, along the podium over several levels with public spaces, which are accessible via stairs and escalators, and uh, to connect the existing green and the surroundings all the way up into the tower. So it was, important to us to basically take the, the quality at a great level, at the street level, and basically take it all the way up um, through the tower, through the entire tower. So each apartment, each office level has this kind of outdoor um, space, outdoor garden, uh, where, where they can experience not only then the, the green quality, but also these amazing views that um, one will have in um, in this kind of height. Um, yeah, and um, another project that uh, that is also currently under construction um, and where actually the basement structure is uh, just being uh, finished and it will grow up slowly is the For Frankfurt project. Um, and uh, what we tried to do here is uh, to actually carefully design an ensemble of four towers, um, which which are formed and and shaped in a way that does not create any backside. 
to the development. So it was it was a key um, driver to position these volumes in a way that um, that they always uh, appear in a in a different perspective. So when you move around this development, sometimes you you can actually um, see only two towers, um, and then you move uh, further ahead and then then another tower is being revealed so we wanted to play a little bit with that composition um, and of course the site constraints um, allowed for opening up this uh, so-called quarter with the uh, public access points so that the public uh, could finally experience this part of the city for the first time since the second world war which was um, yeah which was uh, quite a while ago um, and uh, also we had to keep parts of the existing buildings and um, we uh, used the existing facades to maintain the look and feel of the heritage block in this important location while adding the tower volumes which are rotated towards each other um, so that uh, they can open up viewing lines into the city. Um, another uh, mixed-use project um, is the Raffles City in Hangzhou in China, uh, which was one of the first key projects where we applied this idea of the city within a building. Uh, so basically, it's 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 a very mixed um, program within this development. Um, it consists of retail and entertainment uses along the nine-story building base with accessible um, outdoor terraces. And the two towers include offices, uh, hotel, residential uh, uses, all stacked on top of each other. So in this diagram on the left side, you can see what types of uses there are. So it was a quite challenging, uh, challenging project um to design it in a way that it, it really um really functions well in terms of wayfinding and uh, and so on and so forth so um yeah it it was a it was a challenging project and um it took nine years to be completed uh since we were awarded uh, with the design uh, but it is one that uh, yeah, that we are also very fond of at UN Studio, um, and therefore I wanted to share it as well. Um, now I would like to to talk a little bit about um, a few other projects that are currently on site, which are more related um, and focused around residential uses. So this first image actually um, is, a, is a nice project as well, um, but uh, the projects that I uh, will share are actually, again, towers. But maybe something to mention is that when I, when I said in the beginning that we are using, for example, our product design team um, experiments and try to implement those into our architectural designs, maybe here you can also see a little bit how something like this uh, villa um, and 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 the way it was designed and the way it was formed um, can inspire a building that is a tower that is more than 300 meters high like this so there are some similarities um, maybe that's uh, also interesting to mention where we are really trying to to kind of you know um, overarch the, the between the scales so um the first residential uh, project that i want to share with you is um the wasl tower in dubai um yes uh, once once completed this tower will be one of the tallest structures with a ceramic facade in the world um, and it's in an important location because you can see uh, the, the vicinity to the Millennium Tower. And um, these are not the, the most recent images because um, half of the facade is already installed. But um, yeah, uh, it is topping out at the moment and uh, we are expecting this project to be 
completed in 2023. Um, yeah, and uh, the last project that I would like to mention um, is the Mercedes-Benz Museum um, in Stuttgart. Um, it is a very important project within our portfolio for various uh, reasons. Um, and one of them is uh, because um, this project was one of the first fully digital executed developments where um, mainly 3D modeling has been used to design in an integral way with, with all disciplines. So basically everybody who was involved in this project um, was using one 3D model and we were actually already thinking about that type of collaboration before the word BIM has been introduced within the field of uh, architecture and construction. And uh, by doing that, back in 2006, um, we were actually able to, to build this uh, quite complex structure within budget and within the, the building schedule. Um, and what's also very special about this building is that it includes um, the, the one of a one of its kind uh, smoke exhaust turbine so you can see here on the left left side of the slide and this turbine allows the 50 meter high atrium to be open along its entire height usually if you would design something like this in a public building you would have to add glass facades which would be fireproof all the way through but um, we actually challenged that regulation and we came up with this um, with this huge turbine exhaust so in case of fire the smoke can be extracted with the power of that turbine via the roof um, and the way the visitors experience this building which is another important um, aspect of this design is from the upside down so you basically enter the museum, then you take the elevator and you go up and then you experience the exhibition from the up, upper level down to the ground level. Um, and while you're walking down um, the building, you are seeing the evolution of the of the cars from the very beginning to, to all the future studies they are doing. And um, uh, in some way, this design um, could be compared to, to a DNA string. So the idea kind of originated there. How can we create this kind of continuous loop um, within a building, um, experiencing uh, time and the evolution of cars within it? Um, yes, so... Um, in a way, I started talking about the uh, UN Studios DNA and the key projects in the beginning. And I am ending with this one, um, which is one of the most important ones, which is inspired by a DNA string. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so this closes somehow the loop uh, of this presentation. And um, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention and would like to end the presentation here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph, for this really interesting presentation. And we get a deep look into your work and working method. So now, if you have a little time, mm -hmm. and the audience can ask, and ask you, so please, if somebody have any question, uh, please uh, mark it with the hands, the sign of the hand. Until the audience uh, formulate questions, I want to ask that uh, how you start the project. So what is the first steps in the, in the searching method or, or what, what uh, dimensions uh, are analyzed by your mm. uh, 
teams. So what 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 are the first steps? Yeah, um, well, I think the, the, the first step is really understanding the brief and understanding the client uh, because every project needs a, a different solution. So I think if if I would have to narrow it down to, to something as a, like a first step is really, really um, trying to, to inform ourselves as much as possible about who we are working with and uh, what do uh, do these people really look for so we can really um, design something that is made for them okay and um, what, what uh, so you, you work on a global level and you think on a global level and and how the local culture is important for you so uh, we, we could see that uh, you work for example in 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 the middle east and uh, uh, we sh we see that uh, this uh, local architecture forms or, or atmosphere uh, appeared in your work so mm -hmm. what do you think about the local inspirations yeah i think the example of the middle east is, is, is a good one because um yeah i think we have to we have to get to know the, the local culture. We have to understand uh, how the architecture in, in, in any location um, evolved and um, what defines probably a contemporary uh, interpretation of it. So, um, yeah, I think every time we are designing in, in, um, in countries such as the Middle East, but also anywhere else, we we really are, are studying uh, carefully the heritage and um, and the culture of, of 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 those countries, and this influences a lot the, de the decision taking um, within the design process. And how hard was it uh, working Budapest? So, how deep uh, could you investigate the the local? Uh, atmosphere or local uh, identity because this mm. uh, project Garvani Bridge is in the middle of the empty mm. yes, so it's, it, yeah. it was not easy task that's true that's true but um, I think we we uh, we always um, saw it um, a little bit um, in comparison with what happened in Rotterdam and the Erasmus Bridge because um, back then um, the Erasmus Bridge has been also designed in the middle of nowhere, so to say. Uh, the entire um, other side of, of the bridge has been completely um, empty. So we always saw that specific um, project in Budapest in a similar way that it could actually generate, you know, growth in this area. Um, so, yeah, and I think what what was also important actually for for the proposal of of the of the new Danube bridge was actually analyzing the history of bridges in Budapest. So we actually really looked uh, into all of these uh, bridges and um, somehow back then we we actually identified that many of them are symmetric. Uh, so that was also somehow a, a thought um, that we that we kept in our in our minds. So probably this this idea also kind of um, um, had a little bit to do with our decision in the end. Um, yeah, but I think there is a there is a culture of uh, of bridge uh, of bridges in Budapest. So so I think that was important to understand for us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, is there any question? Waiting for answers. If not. Then thank you very much, Christoph, for mm -hmm. coming and making this really interesting presentation. And I hope that it can help for our students who are working on this site and analyzing this site. Uh, last question, how is the situation with the COVID in your office or in Amsterdam? So working in, in uh, home office or are you together in the studio? Yeah, I am currently at home um, and uh, the recommendation is to, to work from home. Um, but the office is open for a limited amount of people. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, um, I think not everyone is able to work from home. 
So I think we, we just want to make sure that we allow um, those people to come in and, and um, you know, have a comfortable working environment. But uh, yeah, we are still in lockdown in Amsterdam, so yeah. Yeah, the situation is the same. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah, you're and uh, we hope that we can make it meet with all of together in person. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much again for the invitation. Uh, it was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. And um, yes, have a good uh, evening, everyone. Thank you, and for you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening.